X to have uh, one of the most globally recognized cartoonists <laughs> from <laughs> Argentina, uh, a, a country that has um, really a very deep and rich uh, comics and cartooning tradition, uh, but one that's very underrepresented in the United States, both in terms of historical artists as well as contemporary artists. Uh, so I think it's, it's a, a really wonderful thing um, that uh, Ricardo Liniers uh, is here uh, uh, to appear and talk about his work in general, uh, but also to talk about his very first English language uh, publication from Tune Books. So uh, before we get into it, please join me in welcoming Ricardo Liniers. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, and uh, this is this is how you sign your work, just with this uh, Liniers. Yeah, it's it's actually my second name. My my full name is Ricardo Liniers City, which used to mean nothing in the states, city, and now everybody goes like hey, city, yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. <laughs> so Steve Jobs, and um, but Liniers is uh, in Buenos Aires is like a very like known name because there's a neighborhood called Liniers and there's like you know so and since it was stuck right there in my document <laughs> in my ID I just started using it. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to show a bunch of examples of your work but um, since you're here to me it just seemed like a really tremendous opportunity to get just at least a little bit of information mm -hmm. um, about uh, the, the comics um, history and present in Argentina a little bit. I just put together some slides from a few artists who I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. um, and many of these, I should say, um, have not been translated at all in the US or maybe only a little bit. Um, but many of them have been translated quite a bit in Europe. So yeah. there is a big European, uh, uh, a connection between Europe's comics culture and Argentina's comics culture. So I was just wondering if you could just say a few words about uh, some of these. I think a lot of artists yeah. acknowledge Breccia as a this great master. Actually, yeah, Perramus by Breccia and Juan Sasturain is the, the, the script writer. And yeah, he's, uh, Breccia I think it was probably the best, uh, you know, uh, artistically, the best uh, mm -hmm artist, uh, how do you say, mm -hmm. draftman, yeah. you know, the guy that could really, really draw. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, <laughs> I am very far away from Brescia. But he was actually from Uruguay, but did, you know, did all his work in Argentina. Mm -hmm. And nothing, this is a very political, the, the thing I think, the difficult uh, translation we had from Argentina to the States, it probably is on account of their very political, mm -hmm. most cartoonists. Because yeah. you know, most of them uh, worked or lived during the 70s, during the dictatorship. Mm -hmm. So that was a very dense atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of difficult to translate probably to the American democracy, mm -hmm. you know, frame, <laughs> freedom mm -hmm. uh, type of, uh, of living. So, yeah, but you, you should read it. It's really good. <laughs> You're aware of the good ones, so. <laughs> uh, one, of the, um, one of the most, uh, I guess, uh, well-regarded um, script writers or scenarists mm. of that time, Osterheld yeah. uh, disappeared. He actually, he did a very famous book called El Eternauta. Mm -hmm. And it, the, the story is horrible because not only he disappeared, but also his four daughters, you know? Mm -hmm. So there was one woman left without a husband and four daughters. She mm -hmm. just had like a, a, a few grandkids. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I was very lucky just to, you know, have done all my work in, uh, without, because the, the thing with the dictatorship in Argentina was, that it was such a horrible time. And they were, besides of being like horrible people, they were, they were very, they were assholes. <laughs> you know, for lack of a better I think American the word. The yeah. Called dictators. And, um, the thing is, they uh, they did such a bad job that there's actually no way we are going back to that. Mm -hmm. I, I think in Chile they had Pinochet, who was an evil dictator and whatever, but he kind of worked more or less well the economy. Mm -hmm. So in Chile there there are a few you know Pinochet mm -hmm. people like him. I don't know why, but uh, in Argentina nobody likes these guys, so they are far away. Um. Carlos uh, Sampaio, Jose Munoz and Carlos Sampaio um, uh, left Argentina. Yeah, this is this is really sad because I grew up reading Alex Sinner. Yeah. It came up in a magazine in Buenos Aires uh, called Fierro, so I would read it there or whatever. But they are 
actually totally unknown in Argentina. Very, very little. Like there's one book about Gardel that the that the Muñoz did, but they are very, very unknown. I remember once I I ha was doing a you know, talking to some people, and there was like 300 people. I said, does anyone know who Munoz and Sampaio is? And only one guy went like, eh. Mm -hmm. And that guy was the editor of the comic books magazine in Buenos Aires. Mm -hmm. So it's really, I don't know why this happens, that we p produce all these art and these wonderful stories, and the European people get to read them. Mm -hmm. And we don't, that, that's why I started a publishing, actually, endeavor in Buenos Aires, just to fix this thing. <laughs> I don't know why. Yeah, this this has probably been tra the Munoz and Sampaio. My my caption seems mm. to have been cut off. Uh, that was supposed to have Carl Munoz and Sampaio's names on it. Um, they've been translated a little in the U.S. They were in Raw magazine in the 1980s, mm. and yeah. then in the late 80s, maybe into the early 90s, Fantagraphics Graphics did a Sinner series. It's crazy. I read some of those stories. I I, I, I just read these guys' work from Raw. Uh -huh. <laughs> you yeah. Know? yeah, to so. read an American anthology. Yeah. Um, Carlos Nine is that how you say Carlos it? Carlos Nine. Nine. He is amazing. There, are, I've seen quite a few books. He's of his really work good. In his son is also his really son, good. His son, yeah, his son is also very good. It's uh, one time uh, Carlos Nine. To, uh, no, his son Lucas told me that he really likes his name mm. because it's in the middle of Otto Dix. You know mm. the artist, so Otto Nine Dix. You go, oh, okay. <laughs> which is a really silly joke, but mm -hmm. I didn't. Do it. Mm -hmm. But but Nine is like a wonderful uh, storyteller and amazing. You know. He does aquarellas, aquarels, mm, water, yeah. like watercolors, like, mm -hmm. oh. and, and then he's, he's kind of huge, mm -hmm. like a big man and very stern looking. So I'm always scared that he will, you know, tell me like, yeah, it should be better. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I've, I've seen quite a few books of his in, in France, but again, I think he had one story in uh, Little Lit, a children's anthology yeah. edited by... Uh, Spiegelman and Muli, uh, also. but that's I think the only American publication. Those Spiegelman and Muli people are so nice. Yeah. You know, publishing Argentinian authors. Oh. Yeah. Um, but probably the most iconic uh, mm. comics character from Argentina is Mafalda uh, by Kino, who's still living. Although this, uh, what, what was interesting to me is I was a, sort of vaguely aware of Mafalda, mm. like I knew it existed, like I'd seen some Spanish language books, and you know I've seen it, the character around. Um, but when I looked it up, um, it, it seemed to me that it was something that in Argentina had a status almost like Peanuts in the United yeah. States, like Charlie Brown and Snoopy. When I looked it up, uh, I learned that um, the comic strip only ran for about 10 Ten. years, something yeah. like that. Um, and these are just a couple of examples so people can see what it looks like. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it's just a perfect strip, Mafalda, because mm -hmm. it, it has the little kid classic strip. Mm -hmm thing to it but also it's very socially opinionated and you know the all the kids represent some kind of a social you know paradigm or whatever you have like the capitalist little kid and then the rebellious and then the, the shy weird comic book reading little kid mm -hmm. so <laughs> could, <laughs> that, that was me Felipe and uh, yeah, it's just a beautiful strip, but Kino did it for 10 years, and then I think he got, uh, I think he got tired of just the, the, the type of humor it needed, you know, because it's a realist story, and, really, and then he went on to do very surrealist pages, like mm -hmm. very weird, strange humor, mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah, like this there is a, an example of his more like adult. He did a lot of like political yeah. kind of humor. He likes to piss people off, so I like him for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he's still living. Is he still active? Does yeah, he still no, he's, he's he has very poor eyesight, so he stopped drawing. Mm -hmm. But it's I, I did a did a signing with him in this uh, book fair, and it was amazing because there was all these people. And when I'm signing, people come and go like, "Hey, can you draw me a little kid?" When people go to Kino, they actually start crying. You know, they go like, "Oh, Kino!" and kiss his hands and whatever. And I was <laughs> <laughs> so, and they should kiss his hands. You know, yeah, they should. Um, and, and one last one. I, I could be wrong. I think there may have been an attempt to bring some of this work to the U.S. Yeah, she was published in English. Y yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, did you say Maitena? Maitena, yeah. Maitena. She's an enormously popular cartoonist. In uh, all of Latin America and, and also in Europe, in Spain, in France, and sh she's very ob like uh, very acute observational satirist. So mm -hmm. she will find every quirk that you know 
everyone does, like mm -hmm. within a relationship or whatever, she will pinpoint it perfectly. Mm -hmm. So when you're with her, you're really uncomfortable. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> you know she's looking at you going like, you're a moron because of this and of this and of this and this, and I will draw. <laughs> but she's amazing and she's really nice and you know, she was very instrumental in me getting a job because mm. I was doing a cartoon <coughs> in a smaller newspaper in Buenos Aires and she really liked it and she got me a job in her newspaper which is was bigger and they actually paid, mm -hmm. which was fun too. Oh, that's good. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I want to... I think the first uh, comic strip you mentioned was yep. this one, Bonjour, that was the one in the smaller newspaper. Yeah. This was a weekly uh, comic strip that you drew for... Oops. Mm -hmm. uh, that you drew for about um, three years for, I guess, probably a more kind of like alternative sort of newspaper, kind of a culture newspaper. Yeah, it's like a left wing in the socialist newspaper, so you could get away with anything. They're, it's really nice working for those guys. Mm -hmm. Only they generally don't pay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they go like, oh, I remember. It was, it was not a lot of fun because they, they go like, yeah, we'll publish you. There's no money. And they go like, oh, great. Slavery, yeah. <laughs> I love, <laughs> you know, because for some reason in Argentina, there's this feeling that they are doing you a big favor just to, you know, help you with your little hobby. Mm -hmm. And, you know, eventually the, the strip, when it became popular, I started, they started paying me, mm -hmm. like, I don't know, $10, but uh, that was... <laughs> Ten dollars a week, forty dollars a month. <laughs> <laughs> my father um, was really proud. You make well, a good <laughs> career move, <laughs> my son. Yes. <laughs> how did you get to that point, though? I mean, this is, as far as I understand it, this is the first uh, comic strip that you produce regularly. Hmm. How did you get to the point of doing that? Were you always drawing comics growing up? Was it like yeah, your the, goal to be a comic? Good thing for artist? me is I, I I grew up reading comics and I grew up reading a lot of American cartoonists. So my influences are not just like Latin America, Makino or whatever. There's also a lot of, you know, Calvin and Hobbes and Mats and, you know, I, 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 I grew up, I was a fanatic of Berkeley Redhead, you know? Yeah, yeah, uh, Bloom County. Bloom County. Uh -huh. uh, for me, that was a perfect strip. It was so funny. So my influences are kind of all over the place, mm -hmm. I think. Also, I remember when I, because this was a weekly strip. and This just, is two strips yeah, here, I should say. Just doing one strip per week was like not enough, you know, I, I, I need to do more. So I, I read the Tony Millionaire books and I went like, I'm going to do the Tony Millionaire thing. And I started doing a, the little joke behind, yeah. you know, beneath the, the strip. Mm -hmm. And I wrote to Tony Millionaire at, the, at that moment. It was the beginning of internet so you could access people. Like, hey, Tony Millionaire, I'm sorry. I, I'm, robbing you your little idea. And he was like, I took that from Herman, no problem. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. So thank you, Herman. Yeah. Um, and can you talk a little bit about what this comic strip Bonjour was like? First of all, why did you give it a French title? Because uh, it's the people read the, the, the newspaper at the morning. Mm -hmm. So I said, yeah, you should say hi to the people in the morning when they wake up. You go like, why not do it in French? It's <laughs> way more elegant. You go, bonjour. Uh. <laughs> so I guess that was all my thought that went <laughs> into okay. that one. All the thought I wanted to do. And, um, and then with the strip, what I wanted to do was it, it began as a really tiny spot in the newspaper. And I wanted them to print it bigger. So I, every now and then, I would draw like very weird, like complicated cartoons so that they couldn't read it if it was too small. So I go like, hey. Make it bigger because people <laughs> won't understand them. And eventually I want that. <laughs> it, it ended up in a nice big spot. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted like the weirdest ideas that came to my mind. I put them there because I wanted to just, you know, don't don't like call attention. You know, mm -hmm. people notice this thing. So it was a really weird strip mm -hmm. yeah, with penguins dying in car crashes. For some reason, I don't know. I, a lot of my strips, I don't understand them. So, like, there are penguins in a car, and then uh, one is going to be horribly, and the end. <laughs> I don't know. Um, you did this uh, comic strip for a few years, and as you said, with some uh, help, you, you started producing a daily comic strip for a much bigger newspaper. Yeah. The last one was weekly. Whoops, why is this going automatic? Uh, that last one was weekly. 
uh, but Macanudo, the comic that you're still producing, yeah. uh, that you started in 1992, is a daily comic strip. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about how this is different from Bonjour, and also for you, how was it hard? Was it difficult to, to start making a comic strip mm. every single day? Yeah. When when I started doing Bonjour, I remember I spent like the whole week thinking of the idea and drawing and whatever, and just at the end I had like something. But then at the last stages of Bonjour, or the last months of, I would just draw, like I had to hand in the, this strip on Tuesday, so I would draw it Tuesday morning, mm -hmm. and hand it in on Tuesday, and then the rest of the week I would watch TV, and you know? <laughs> so then I went like, hey, it's going to be like every day is a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. eh, it doesn't look very hard. But uh, so I've been living in a Tuesday rut for the last 10 years. Yeah. And you haven't watched TV <laughs> since then? <laughs> Never, no, no more. Mm -hmm. um, and these are, these are covers uh, to Macanudo collections. Can you tell us what Macanudo means? Yeah, Macanudo is a, an Argentinian word. And also they use it in Uruguay or maybe Chile. And it's just a happy word. It's mm -hmm. like, like you guys say cool. Hey, this guy is cool. This is a cool situation. It's kind of oldie time also. Mm -hmm. And when I started doing my strip in Buenos Aires, we were amidst the worst uh, the economic chaos. Like we were, you know, like imagine America like right now, but worse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So we were, and there's a lot of pessimism that comes in a in a in an economic upheaval. No, mm -hmm. so I remember just opening the newspaper. This was 2002, also. So you would open the newspaper, and they go like, "Oh my God, we're all gonna die!" And like the towers, and you know, Bush, <laughs> and then you know, the, the economic, and fuck it, ah! And then you go on the next page. Oh, oh my God! So that was the whole newspaper. It was just mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. Horrible stories across the, just you know, pack up and go. So, I wanted to do like uh, a counter, like an anti-establishment thing, like optimism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, macanudo. And okay, they just have to print the little word, and I was fine, you know. Mm -hmm. And it took off from there. And it's I did that one. I embroidered. Well, that I was going one. to say, yeah. yeah. One thing that's interesting, looking at all these covers, is um, you know, often when you look at like. Co collections of comic strips, whether it's like Snoopy or Calvin and Hobbes mm. or whatever, one of the things you can tell just from looking at the books is that like uh, there's you know a consistent style and characters who appear over and over again. And you do have a cast of characters, but looking at these covers, it's obvious <laughs> that like it's not about characters exactly. No. It's oops, it's about it's I don't know. It's, it's about your point of view. You know, no, it's about your point of view, and it's and. It's not about even a particular visual style because hmm. that changes from collection to collection also. Um, and this is like a really fascinating group of images. This is the si There have been many collected editions of Macanudo. We just saw the covers for the first five. Then this is like an omnibus for one through five. Hmm. Um, sorry that the slides keep jumping around. I'm not sure why that's <laughs> happening. But, um, uh, but then this one is for Macanudo volume six. And can you explain what we're looking at here? Yes, Th that was, what, sometimes you have like a, an idea and you think, oh, I'm such an avant-garde artist. Yeah, 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 I'm a G, this is great. Because mm -hmm. uh, what happened was I was talking with some editors of mine and we were actually talking about this, how every you know, book cover I changed the style on this mm -hmm. and that. And so my editor told me, oh, one day you'll do all the covers by hand, you crazy, crazy little, Cartoonist, and I went like everybody laughed, ha 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 ha, and I went like, yeah, that sounds yes, I have to do that. <laughs> so, when we started doing our publishing thing, this uh, commun, our, our publishing house, uh, I said, well, let's do this, let's let's do all the covers by hand. Mm -hmm. So my wife said, don't be an idiot, <laughs> <laughs> do a thousand. That's a lot of books. Do a thousand, and I was like, no, no, it has to be. Epic. It has to be, you know, those guys that go up a mountain or something. It has to be. And they went, ah, 2,000, no, oh, three, then 5,000. Mm -hmm. So what happened is, you don't really understand 5,000 books till you see them. <laughs> if you're the first published book you have. So these 5,000 books came to our house, and there are a lot of books, a lot of boxes. <laughs> And we had like, a, my daughter was at the moment six months old. She was really young, you know, and perfect and cute. 
And there was this smell of glue in the apartment, really pungent. So we would all having like weird dreams. We, we, like my wife, me, my little daughter, we imagine she didn't told us, but you know, they must be dream weird when they're six months old so anyway. So, and I started in Macanudo, and for some reason I did it in two colors just to be more of an asshole. And <laughs> so, Macanudo, M C A D A A A, blah, 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 six, one. Right? And that 5,000 times, yeah. It was, it was, because when you're in 300, you're like, oh, I'm a genius. This is, ha, oh, ha, ha, art. Oh. And then when you're like in 3,000, you're, you're crying. Going like, oh. <laughs> and my wife's, you're an asshole. What the? And the, the distributors are going like, yeah, we need more. We need more. Mm -hmm. So it was, yeah. And those are, some of them I did for friends. So some of them look nicer. Than, mm -hmm. I didn't do all of them nice, mm -hmm. though. <laughs> that one I started backwards because you're going like this, blah, 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 and then I blah, blah, and then I open it. Oh shoot! Well, <laughs> let's do a crazy one, you know? <laughs> Gary Panther, I'm an artist, you know. <laughs> um, well, anyway, but these these are these are covers, obviously. How many collected editions of Macanudo have there been now? Like it's uh, the last one we put out is ten. Ten. So. Um, but these are just some examples from the comic strip. Hmm. This one I like because you have the direct reference to Mafalda. Do you see this comic strip as being in a tradition? Yeah, definitely. The thing is, this little girl and the cat, mm -hmm. the little girl is called Enriqueta, and the cat is called Fellini. Mm -hmm. uh, also, they're a homage to Fellini. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I, I have these two characters, and you know, Enriqueta is, I, I imagine, it comes from, from somehow from Mafalda. But what I didn't want to do when I started revisiting this character in the strip was going to the Mafalda area, mm -hmm. which is, or, or Peanuts even, you know, the little group of kids. Because mm -hmm. it was uh, just, you know, trying to do again something that was already perfectly done. So uh, what I wanted was how I remember childhood. And I was a very shy, shy, like, I'm not shy anymore. <laughs> I was a very shy boy. So. I remember me be being very alone, very lonely with books, and I would love to read books and read comics and read, you know, Mark Twain or whatever. So I kept Enriqueta very isolated from everyone. Mm -hmm. She just had her little cat and then a little, you know, teddy bear. And that's more or less her world because I, I imagine her as being very uh, kind of uh, shy. Mm -hmm. yes. And sometimes you appear as a character in these comics yeah. as well. This character here, whoops. That's another little nice story. Because in Bonjour, I used to draw myself. I love, you know, Robert Crumb. And I love people who kind of investigate their own stories with themselves. It's, I love stand-up. Mm -hmm. So I wanted that in the, in the strip. So in Bonjour, I tried every now and then. And if I drew myself as I am, I would generally be mean to me. <laughs> Because I didn't want people thinking I was uh, egocentric or something, mm -hmm. which I am, you know, but mm -hmm. I didn't want them thinking. So yeah, I didn't kind of like it. And then I, I, I was in a trip in Berlin, and I kind of did this very fast, because I used to do a lot of cartoons with rabbits. And yeah, I kind of liked it. You know, I went like, ah, that would be like a character. It's not me, but it's me. But ah, that could work. And then I remembered. I went like, oh, but Matt Greening. Oh, she, he, you know, he draws himself as a rabbit and draws all these rabbits. And, and then I went like, oh, fuck McGreening. <laughs> <laughs> he won't ever find out this, you know. He, like, and then one day my, my, my sister calls me on the phone and, and she tells me, hey, do you remember my friend Agustina from school? Yeah, yeah, really nice, Agustina, pretty. Yeah, yeah. Well, she's the girlfriend of Matt Greening and he wants to meet you. I was like, what? Mm -hmm. I was in Buenos Aires, not Matt Green. No, I wasn't in Springfield, you know? I was in Buenos <laughs> Aires. So, and actually, so Matt Green, now he's married and I have a kid with my sister's friend. Okay. So we're good friends, yeah. And he's fine with it. He he's was okay. like, ah, oh, I'm it's not fine. suing, it's fine. He doesn't, you know? own, he doesn't own rabbits. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but what, also what happened was my first characters, all these rabbits that I used to draw even before Bonjour, uh, what my f the first character I did, I'm, I'm going to do a little, so that you know I can draw very well, no? So I, I wanted to 
come up with, with a character. I, was, I am not a very good draftsman. Eh? I'm, I'm nice, but not very good. And I couldn't come up with anything good. And I was like, oh, this is impossible. And then I saw two, two things. I saw this, you know, life in hell. Uh, I'm very sorry, Matt, but I'm going to try to do Binky, there you go. So there you go, life in hell, the little rabbit, you know? And then I saw, I read, of course, like everyone, and blew my mind, choo-choo, mouse, you know? So you have Spiegelman and Matt Greening. Mm -hmm. They're fairly easy to draw, you know? <laughs> it's not very complicated. So what I did was I took off the years of one and put it on the thing of the other. So I have like the ears here and the little, so. So this was my character, you know? <laughs> this was mine. No, <laughs> I, I'm a creator now, great, great, yeah. <laughs> and then my greening came into it and I had to, you know, kind of <laughs> show him that I had stolen him. But then, like a few years ago, Francois Mouly contacted me. You know, to publish something, and I was like, "Oh fuck!" Now I have to tell Spiegelman. Damn. <laughs> so, it's everything is fine with Spiegelman as well. <laughs> also, no suit, no litigation. Very nice people. Okay. So, what I mean to say is, if you want to steal from Spiegelman and Matt Groening, they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> they don't care. <laughs> Pick away. Um, I wanted to show a few more examples of the strip. The ones mm. that feature these characters who you were just talking about tend to be oops, like very um, you know, beautiful and, and sweet. There's a real kind of sweetness that mm. comes through. In some ways, it's got like, you were talking about like your American influences. It reminds me of kind of the fluidity of you know, Calvin and Hobbes. Um, it's got something like, um, it reminds me, oops, it has something like the sweetness of Mutz by Patrick McDonald mm. and some other comics too. Yeah, I what what I like to do in the strip is change a lot the the type of humor it has. Mm -hmm. Like it it it's, it's n never because for me the surprise is mm -hmm. like the basis mm -hmm. of humor. You know, if if I see something coming, mm -hmm. I won't laugh. I, I maybe even be like, yeah, hey, that was funny, but I won't. You know, it w it won't be such a like a. But if if you don't see something coming. It's like a, box, a boxer, you know? You, you don't have to see where the big... So it changes. Sometimes it's like sweet and tender. Sometimes it's like dark humor. Sometimes it's just absurd and abstract. Sometimes it's... I, I like that. It's mm -hmm. schizophrenic, like I was saying. It's yeah. a, so sometimes, ah, when something is nice, it doesn't need marketing. Mm -hmm. And I have a superpower. I know I have, like, I, like you know those X-Men yeah. that had, like, really crappy superpowers mm -hmm. that they are all depressed about? Like, oh, fuck, this is a crappy superpower. Well, I, I, I could be an X-Men. And my superpower is getting girls to go, like, oh. <laughs> I, I, it's amazing. I can do it, like. This, you know, uh, and when you're a guy, you don't want them to go. Oh, you want them like more. Ah, but <laughs> that's why my wife lets me, you know. So you go like, oh, when something is, it doesn't mean need marketing. Oh, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, sometimes you have these, as you're saying, that you have different um, types of comics, and some of them are very like hmm. formally inventive or experimental, you know. Yeah, that was Origami Oops. Boy. Because uh -huh. the thing is, <laughs> I I was. Uh, I was drawing all these penguin stories, mm -hmm. you know, all these penguin stories. In, and when I, I was walking in, through the newspaper in Buenos mm -hmm. Aires and I saw the guy at the tourism, you know, section, uh, voyage section. And, and I, I, I was very funny. I went like, hey, if, if you're ever, ever invited to Antarctica, remember that I do, I'm the penguin expert. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm the penguin expert. I'm just kept on walking, very happy with my funny, funny joke. And like a week later, the guy called me and said like, hey, they're inviting us to Antarctica because you're the expert in penguins. So I went on all this, this trip to Antarctica, and then I went like, ah, I want to go to Japan. So I came up with the Origami Boy, but still no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, nothing, it didn't work. Yeah. But I did go to Antarctica, see all these penguins. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, one of the things you see is like there's a real mix of, of visual styles in this work, <laughs> um, different sort of playful ways of using. That's playful also. I didn't have him, you know, I was kind of in a hurry. 
Uh-huh. <laughs> you know? Sometimes it's, ah, ha, ha. Sometimes it's, ah, oh, it has agoraphobia. Great. Yeah. <laughs> that was very fast. Mm-hmm. But you, you do see this kind of, like, using uh, the sort of space of the comic strip in mm. very different ways sometimes. Who is this character, by the way? That's the, kind um, of great It's looking. called the Mysterious Man in Black. Uh-huh. And I have no idea, because he's mysterious, so I don't really know what he means or anything. Mm-hmm. And then he saw another Mysterious Man in Black, and that was just mysterious. So I went like, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that's another mysterious moment. Mm-hmm. That's how he turns. Yeah. I, I don't understand most of these jokes, actually. <laughs> I have no idea what they mean. Yeah. But the way that you're sort of... Um, I mean, the, the daily comic strip is a very constrained format, but you're using it in a lot of different ways mm. that reminds me of like the very early American comic strips. Well, I love, uh, you know, Windsor McKay yeah. and just, you know, going through those guys. But, but yeah, the, it's just because the, part, the, the, the drawing aspect of doing comics I really love. Mm-hmm. Like, I... I for me, it was always amazing, like, you know, Schultz did 50 years of the same, uh, more or less the same square, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the same point of view, the same, which is amazing, and I love it, but I couldn't do that. I would hate penguins mm-hmm. <laughs> very fast <laughs> if I had yeah. to do 50 years of drawing the same penguin in the mm-hmm. same, uh, so, yeah, I like to go and have fun. Mm-hmm. These are just a couple of examples of mm-hmm. other ways that you've sort of uh, use yeah. the format of the daily comic strip. It's very interesting. Those are nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I wanted to show some uh, some of the other work that you've done outside of the comic strip. This, I think, is, um, if I understand it correctly, a kind of autobiographical diary hmm. or, di- or memoir uh, type comic about your travel to Antarctica. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit that, about this? That was fun. That was when, when I did my little silly joke and they yeah. invited me on like a... It was... Yeah, 20 days mm-hmm. on a big boat with like English and Norwegian tourists mm-hmm. and us. And uh, we realized that, that I, I guess in Europe, a lot of people go like, oh, you have to see Antarctica before you die. So a lot of them were kind of elderly, you know, like they would go, <laughs> oh, yeah, this is very nice. And, this is, oh. and then one night, <laughs> one night, <laughs> this is not funny. I don't know why I'm laughing. <laughs> But one died. <laughs> mm-hmm. I remember Mr. Brown. I don't remember the name. But they, uh, uh, you know, they told us on the intercom. Uh, we are very sorry to announce that our fellow <laughs> traveler, Mr. Brown, has passed away. And I went like, Oh no, poor Mr. Brown. And I was very kind of. I I didn't. There was like 300 people. I don't remember who how he looked or anything. So, but I was oh poor Mr. Brown. And then I thought. Huh, Maybe they throw him from the side of the boat, <laughs> you know, like the movies. That, that would be fun to draw. Mm-hmm. Great. <laughs> so I started, you know, expecting the big things from Mr. Brown to, you know, the little English flag and <laughs> some people, you know, shooting guns in the air or something like that, and nothing. And like days kept going on, and we're like, where is Mr. Brown? <laughs> Where is Mr. Brown? And then you start looking at the salmon you're eating and going like, it must be in the same fridge. You know, they, I don't know if they have like a special dead people fridge in this boat. <laughs> oh, well, it, well, it was a good salmon, so I kept yeah. a little bit of... Eh. <laughs> Did you ever find out? Uh, no, no. Okay. We, I, maybe we ate him, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't understand most of the food, so... Yeah. Um, one of the things that comes up in the strip sometimes too is, uh, you know, obviously an engagement with fine art. Hmm. Sometimes you show Pablo Picasso uh, as a character in some of these uh, strips, and you have some engagement with fine art yourself. Sorry, these are going so fast. I really yeah, to stop I have this. some engagement with art. Well, if you're speaking about Picasso and then saying like, yeah, and you also like Picasso, do a little bit of fine art now. <laughs> well, no, no. But what I'm saying is, you you also have, you know, some kind of. I think you have some kind of concept of fine arts and, and what a fine artist does. I mean, you, you've mm. illustrated a book about uh, the life of Andy Warhol, and you do some painting yourself. You work outside of the comic strip context. You mm. make unique objects that are not work for reproduction necessarily. Mm. You also do live painting that we can see some images from, too. Is this an important part of your artistic practice? How do you see this as related to your yes, comic strips? It's, uh, the thing is, when I started painting and drawing and doing, I I started when I was three years old, Mm -hmm. like everyone, you know, they give you a little pen and and you go like, 
Line, this is amazing. I, my three-year-old kid now is like going through an abstract expressionist phase, mm -hmm. and she's amazing. Mm -hmm. She, we have a big blackboard in our kitchen, and and it was Basquiat what she was doing. I was like, I can't do that. You're five. And she was like, Yeah, I'm very good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but I always like to paint. But for a while there, it was very hard for me because. Because uh, I would approach the 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 like the material like very in a very scared fashion because it was very expensive when I was 18, 19 years old. So it would be expensive to buy you know an oil painting and two brushes and one and then you spend like five compact discs in this thing. So and then you went like oh I don't want to fuck up. <laughs> And then you go like this, and I go like, oh, I don't like it. Mm -hmm. And I spent all this money. So I was, you know, I would, but with cartoons, it was way cheaper because you just drew, and I developed it. And then what happened was with my friend Kevin Johansen, who's a musician, you can see there, mm -hmm. with a little guitar. He invited me to do these things on, on, on his shows while he was playing. I would draw, and that would show up. And, and when someone, when, when you're in a, in a stage, you can't be scared. But what you're going to do, you just have to go like, oh my god, and and suddenly I started having fun. Like I, I remember one time because we do sometimes this thing with a camera and I draw, mm -hmm. and uh, we did a few shows where I just did a, like a big canvas, you know, like um, probably like from that end to this end, like huge canvas, and I had to paint it in two and a half hours, three hours of show. So you know you have to be, and in this show I had like my ten little things of paint, mm -hmm. and the brushes, and the curtain opens, everybody claps, I send kisses to my fans, and whatever, and I go like, ah, hello, hello. And then I grab the brushes, and I grab the things, and I went like this, and they didn't fit. Oh. Like, all the brushes were bigger. Too wide for yeah, too wide. <laughs> and people were clapping, I was like, oh, shoot. <laughs> oh. Kevin was like, hey, baby, I kiss you. you know? And so I went like, well, fuck it. I just put my hand in the thing and started going like, you know, wah, like the crazy Lasco <laughs> Altamira cave painter going like, ah. And I remember at the end of the show, the, the musicians turned to me and said like, eh, well, it was more rock and roll today, eh, dude? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's the, the, so that's how I approach painting now. Like, just see, it's it, the, the, when I do comics, it's more rational, mm -hmm. and when I paint, it's more like uh, you know intuitive, I guess. And you've switched roles too. This is a picture of you. Yes. Before. Are you? Do you play music? Yes, I'm very good. Oh, okay. No, <laughs> no. What what actually happens there is like people. We do it so that people know how really good we are at what we do. Okay. So when we do that, people go like, "Oh, Kevin." He's really a good singer. Yeah. <laughs> this guy is horrible. And the same with him. And I only know the, the, the chords for knocking on heaven's door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I bought the harmonica just to, for the photograph. Mm -hmm. you know? And I go like, <laughs> and the thing is, when, when I'm alone with the guitar, I'm a three, a four. Mm -hmm. you know? But when the whole band joins me, I'm really good. I'm going mm -hmm. like, I, I'm sounding exactly like the record. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, <laughs> It's fun. Yeah. Um, I wanted to show some of your uh, children's work mm. um, because the book that uh, you have that's um, debuting here, SPX, is uh, a comic for kids. Um, the, I know you've done some work specifically for children in Argentina. This book is um, more like a picture book. We see yeah. it spread here. It looks like it's in a kind of traditional one image per page format, is that true? This is just based yeah. on images I was able to find. Yeah, what I did, that was the, a, a friend who's a publisher asked me for a book and I really liked the, the collection of books that they had. So I wanted to do something that I, that, that I w would be proud. And I started, I love children's literature and I love, uh, you know, children's books. I, I, Maurice Sendak, and, um, mm -hmm. Dr. Seuss or whatever, I love them. I, I have a lot of fun reading them now to my daughters. And I really admire those guys. So. It drove me crazy, this book. Like, how do you talk to a kid? And how do? You... And I have a friend who does a lot of, uh, she actually won the Astrid Lindgren Award mm -hmm. this year, so she, she's really good. And I was talking to her and saying like, how do you, do you try to remember how you were a kid? Try to put your frame of mind in the frame of mind of the kid? And then she went like, no, 
moron. I just told a story that I like. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, like a Zen moment, you know. <laughs> oh. Deplete your mind from stupid thoughts. And so, and, and I remember this thing that happened to me when I was a kid. It's actually based on a true story because uh, when, when my parents turned, I, I have this very vivid recollection of my parents saying like, good night, good night, when I must have been four, five. And when they turn off the light, since I couldn't see the ceiling, I, th I, I remember I used to think the ceiling disappeared because it's not there anymore, so I, it must have disappeared. This is how the world works. No? <laughs> so I didn't understand physics very much, so I was like, oh, no ceiling, this is amazing. And I remember <laughs> like imagining, my brain imagining a, a tiger coming like in, spiraling down from the ceiling, and that's the end of my memory, mm -hmm. which is a weird one. So I went like, oh, that's a good idea for a little book to scare people, little kids. Mm -hmm. And it's called, Lo que hay antes de que haya algo, it's going to be translated in English, I think, next year. Okay. And uh, so in Spanish, in, in English, it would be what there is bef before there is something there, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's a little story for existentialists, mm -hmm. kids. Um, and the, the most recent um, book now is The Big Wet Balloon, which is mm. from Tune Books. It's being published simultaneously oops, in the United States in both um, English language and Spanish language editions. Uh, it's your first uh, American publication, and it's a children's book, but as uh, with every other book in the Tune Books line, uh, published by Francoise, it's a children's comic. It's mm. a comic for children. Um, can you talk a little bit about how this book came to be and yeah. how you chose to, uh, or how you chose the subject matter, I guess, for this book? It, it started with, Francoise wanted to publish uh, a book just with the strips of Enriqueta and Fellini, you know, the little mm -hmm. girl and the little cat from Macanudo. So she wanted to do that. And I was like, I, I remember telling my agent, saying, say yes to everything, because I want to meet Art Spiegelman and tell him about this thing. <laughs> so so I, I don't care. Yeah, whatever. They don't pay, I don't care. I don't care. They pay, though. <laughs> but um, so I was like, you know, just really happy to get this call. But then what happened was that another publishing house is going to actually publish the Macanudo books. Mm -hmm. It's called Enchanted Lion. So I told uh, Francois, well, well, if there's going to be a, hello? <laughs> if there's going, a fan, yes. <laughs> if there's going to be a, a, a book with the, the Enriqueta, they kind of overlap. I don't know, maybe I could do like one book especially for you, you know, specifically for you. And then I started thinking, what do I do? And you know, they liked the girl with the cat. I do a boy with a dog. I don't know. I like, <laughs> this is how far I think, you know. <laughs> and um, so I was like, I had no idea what to do, and and I was thinking, thinking. And then one day we were in summer in in Uruguay, and uh, I, I, my two girls were three years old and five years old, you know. Tiny, tiny, and, my, and it was raining, and my wife put her in these kind of trench coats that were very funny looking, like yellow and you know gray. And and then I saw them go out to the porch of this house and just looking at the rain, and the the one that's five years old went like great rain, and she just started running like this is crazy fun, wow, because they are crazy, and but the three years old one, I, I guess she never really saw like a downpour like that. So she went out like really slowly and just stood there, like freezed, like this, with her arms like this. And I remember going from the back of her and going, Clemmy, how about that rain? Eh? Fun. And she looked at me like, I have no idea what this is. <laughs> this is the weirdest thing ever. Like, what is going to happen next? I'm freaking out. So I, I suddenly I went like, that's the book, that, that, this is amazing. And I started taking photographs and taking notes and whatever. And eventually, Clemmy got like you know, loosened up and started playing with Matilda. And we're like, this is great. And the, eventually, they wanted to come back in. Like, we are really cold, Daddy. No, keep playing, keep playing. I'm inspired, <laughs> you know, Daddy's inspired. <laughs> you know, we're cold. We want to go back in. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> so, yeah, it was fun. For me, at least, yeah. <laughs> have kids, they're great, you know? <laughs> they pay for themselves, you know? I'm gonna make a lot of money from this, I'm not giving them a cent. <laughs> they, they don't know how to spend it, they would probably spend it in, I don't know, like silly toys or something, no, I'm keeping them. 
<laughs> and, and this book is upstairs uh, at the Tune Books table. We have we have time for maybe one or two questions. If anyone has one, we're a little tight on time. But yes. Hola. Hello. Oh. Hola. Sí. Um, I'm just going to ask the question in English so everyone can understand, okay. I guess. Um, I saw these pictures on Facebook about this um, hotel in Cordoba, I think. It's called Macanudo. Oh, and yeah. the whole aesthetic, is, it looks really similar to um, your aesthetic. I don't know if this is something yeah. that you're behind or... This was... Uh, yes, I'm an hotel owner. <laughs> <laughs> I made so much money. <laughs> what actually happened is some guys in, in Cordoba, they put Macanudo to their... I don't own the word. You know, just like, like you know, Matt Greening doesn't own rabbits. Mm -hmm. I don't own the word Macanudo. So the guys went like, and put their the hotel bar Macanudo, and it was. But then they found me uh, doing some signing or whatever, and they were like, "Dude, we are a hotel and it's called Macanudo. Can you come and you know paint?" Or, so they gave me a few beers for free. So I was like, "Yeah, sure." <laughs> I put Macanudo all over the place. I am very cheap, so I, you know. <laughs> So, no, I have nothing to do with the hotel, but uh, I should own stock or something, because, you know, yeah, yeah they must be raking it in. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Um, you mentioned uh, you have a publishing endeavor mm -hmm. in Buenos Aires. Uh, what's the name? Comun. Comun. And, and how many books? You, did you start that in like 2004? Uh, I started that in 2008 with, um, with Macanudo Seis, the one I hand drew. We, we named it Comun because we thought if it becomes like a thing, like a movement, then you can use all the, com the communism, you know? And then you have all those posters that are really great and mm -hmm. you can kind of use them. But uh, the thing is, uh, the, it got me really eventually mad just to go to Europe, to Barcelona, France, and see all these Argentinian books of Argentinian authors that we, I couldn't buy them at the local bookstore in Buenos Aires. And uh, that eventually got, got me pissed off, because it's like if you guys couldn't go and, you know, I don't know, watch Spielberg movies, because mm -hmm. you only have Spielberg movies in Europe, you're like, eh, Spielberg is one of us, yeah. So I, uh, we started doing this, this thing where, where we use Macanudo that we know it really, you know, it sells to kind of keep afloat other books that are harder to sell, but they are way better than Macanudo. <laughs> so, uh, and also we try to find books from abroad that that are kind of easy, not, not in the term of, a, you know, how some comic books, you give it to anyone and they will like it, like Mouse, for example. Anyone can read that book. Like people who don't read comics read Mouse. And, and sometimes some other books are really hard, are really difficult and, you know. So Chris Ware, maybe, you got like one of those weird ones. And you're like, what do I have to read here? So we try to find those books that are more accessible to inspire the, the authors. But also what we really like to do is find like uh, young Argentinian or Latin American authors, because there's uh, a lot of, uh, of amazing artists coming up right now, because we all have internet, and so everybody is more aware now of all these guys, and, and just, uh, you know, publish them. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Please join me in thanking Ricardo Liniers for being with us. Say cheese, say cheese. You're all going into it. Like Instagram. <laughs> <laughs>